Greetings, my fellow cohabitants of the planet Jasum. Thank you for joining me and I hope you guys are all safe and well. Now, before we get started, a very tiny proportion of you guys have let me know using some very colourful language that you prefer to watch these videos without any commentary or any music. So, instead of using some colourful language of my own and being confrontational, I thought I'd provide a solution. So I have done another version without the commentary for you guys who have this ASMR fetish. And that's another acronym I have recently learned which I didn't even know existed. ASMR. So if you would like to see that version, the link is in the description below or you can also find it in my channel. And for the rest of you who see these videos as tutorials and prefer commentary and explanations, then please sit back, relax and enjoy while I take you through the restoration of this Breitling chronomat from the 1980s. Now it may not appear so, but this piece is quite an important piece historically. This particular piece and model was produced during the 80s, just off the back of the quartz revolution, or in Breitling's case, the quartz crisis. Now many of you may have heard of this quartz crisis, but I was thinking of doing a small audio file on the subject for you guys so you can fall asleep to it. So if you want to hear that, please let me know in the comments. There's a bolt missing here. So straight off the bat, I can see that there are some parts missing on this movement. Now this was somebody else's unfinished project and other people's projects are most often the hardest and most trickiest to undertake as you don't know just quite what to expect. Most of you would have noticed by now that this is the famous Valjoux 7750 which is currently not working. What are you doing? He's my little helper today because you're not helping me. Where you been all day? Yes, trouble is here. Now in the UK the school's open for one week and then somebody sneezed. <laughs> and so his whole year group was sent home and told to self-isolate for 14 days. So he will be annoying, helping us out for a couple of weeks. They don't want to come out, these blooming screws, do they? They don't like you. <laughs> they don't like me. Yeah. They don't like anybody. Look at the company. Boing, 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 boing. Ah. Oh yeah, we got one. He's broken. Oh dear me. Boy. So now you have a small glimpse boing. of the bush fixes boing. that were administered to this watch by the previous tinkerer. <laughs> now these are actually plugs and not real screws. Only the four bezel riders have real screws. And you can see all the gold detailing is actually just gold plating and not solid gold. It was all about cost cutting in order to survive. Okay, grab it with the tweezers. Good boy, you over there. Thank you for your help. Okay, grab it with your tweezers. Aye. Super glue. Super glue. Mm, somebody used super glue. That's what you need, super glue. So here you can see one of the bush fixes where a broken screw head has just been super glued into a plug hole. these two bezel riders wouldn't come off and I suspect more super glue was used. And here we have another cost cutting measure I imagine with this very simple ratchet spring design. So back to the importance of this particular piece uh, and the chronomat series as a whole. Uh, like many other Swiss watch manufacturers 
Breitling itself was facing bankruptcy due to cheap quartz watches flooding the market. And so manufacturers of mechanical watches were struggling. Delicious. Chocolate, arm chocolate. I want arm chocolate. And so, in order to survive, companies like Breitling had to think outside of the box. And one of these remarkable moves made by Breitling was to use Japanese quartz movements in some of their watches. Yes, as shocking as it may sound. So, as you guys just saw, I've broken the tip off the 12 o'clock bezel rider. So I'll have to source another one. So after soaking the bezel in some acetone to loosen any super glue that was used on these bezel riders, you can see that the bezel riders are actually brass and plated in gold, which is a reoccurring theme on this particular model. So whilst quartz watches had almost taken over everything, Breitling made a bold decision to release the chronomat and rebrand itself not just as a tool watch, but as a luxury item. But the watch had to be affordable and attractive to buyers who were purchasing cheap quartz watches, and it also had to be profitable. And so the illusion of luxury and road to profitability was achieved by gold plating a lot of the detailing, um, using plugs instead of real screws, and using an off-the-shelf ETA movement without adorning it in any way. So after cleaning the super glue, you can see that there is a broken screw inside this plug hole and it's also been countersunk. So I would hazard a guess that somebody has tried to thread the hole in order to put a screw in there. Now I'm trying to screw it out using another screw, but there isn't a visible thread for the screw to catch onto. So I'll just have to drill it out. Now I'm using a damaged drill bit here to drill straight through the center of the screw. Uh, the drill bit has lost its sharp spiral. This will help avoid any damage to the wall of the hole or if there is already a cut thread in there which I can reuse. And so here you can see the famous Valju 7750 and this is a bog standard off the shelf version which Breitling has not improved in any way and the rota is not even signed. 
usually a brand would take this off the shelf movement and they would add some improvements to it, such as adorning it with Geneva stripes, improving the shock settings, adding their branding to the movement and the rotor, amongst other mechanical and aesthetic improvements. But this would have been costly and would have added to Breitling's bottom line. One of these chronograph pusher tubes just doesn't want to come out. I think it's rusted shut. The threaded part is still stuck inside. So I'll just use a ball drill to shave the tube out without damaging the thread on the hole itself.
Now, there are signs all over this watch that in its 40 year history, it has had some minor water ingress. And this is evident from the chronograph pushers that were rusty. The dial has some patina and staining and you will see shortly from the movement, there are small bits of rust here and there. Now the legendary Valju 7750 started showing up in watches in the 70s. And this is the early iteration 17 joule version. The 7750 is still in use by many watch manufacturers today and it has been improved and refined with a 25 joule version. Ooh, plastic. Nice. I think we'll call it a day on that side. No plastic. Mm -hmm. Plastic.
Now, some people may just replace the whole mainspring as they come as a whole unit. But for educational purposes, we will clean this one and reinstall it. And I'm just marking the orientation of the spring here. What have you done, man? Removing the mainspring is one of the most ungraceful parts of watchmaking, and it can make a fool out of the best of us. So be careful when you're doing this, as it will jump out and slap you in your face if you're not careful. So did I. Oh yeah, it's gone. Mm -hmm. I need to, I need to know some about Okay. Actually, I already know this. Abu, I already know this. Yeah. Yeah. But some Do you? Okay then. Okay then. Now there is a lot of discussion out there on whether to apply a small amount of grease to the mainspring before installing it. Uh, however, I have not added any grease um, and I'm just following the manufacturer's oil chart. So, do you remember the orientation that we made a note of? Well, while the mainspring is in the tool, the orientation should be in the opposite direction. Because once you flip it into the barrel, the orientation will be the correct way. This stuff must be made out of a unicorn caviar, as it's 80 pound just for a small 5 milligram tub. This is Kluber P125, which is a braking grease. And since this is an automatic mainspring, it needs to slip when it's fully wound inside the barrel. Bosh, it's in. And now you can see that the orientation is correct. Now, if you are attempting to service and oil this movement, then it's a good idea to print out these oil sheets um, instead of following an idiot like me. As over the years, we tend to forget uh, to use these sheets and go off by memory. And so any bad habits that we pick up, you will just pick them along the way as well. Uh, these oil sheets are very handy as it tells you exactly what oil to use and where to use them and you can tick off each oil point as you go along. Now I seem to have lost some parts in the wash. Can you guess what they are?
a few were hiding in my wash basket and another one was hiding inside the cleaning machine. And also this mini counter jumper eccentric was missing from the beginning. Now every watchmaker has a stash of value 7750 parts lying around somewhere. So I will try and find a replacement in my stash of parts. I also have these very handsome looking rotors. And as you can see, our rotor looks quite sad and sorry. The rhodium plating on the oscillating weight has faded. But I'll try and restore this just to keep as many original parts as possible. Here's the eccentric. And here are some of the oils that I will be using. And now the oil chart for the 17 joule version of this movement is available online. However, the print is quite poor and hard to read. So I'll be using a combination of the old 17 joule version oil chart and also the modern 25 joule version. And a lot of you are very interested in this part of the restoration. So I will go through as many of the oils and oil points as possible. So I've just installed the mainspring barrel first, then the escape wheel, followed by the second wheel, the third wheel, and the great wheel. Now goes in the hacking lever, or stop lever as it's known. And this stops the watch from working when you're in hand setting mode. So now you can put the barrel and train wheel bridge on and make sure you've aligned all the pivots uh, correctly before screwing anything down. Now I'm just installing that missing eccentric and this is just friction fit. And now I'm using some D5 beneath the crown wheel and you can use a modern synthetic version of this which is HP 1300. And some more D5 on the rim before the crown wheel core goes in. Once again, a little bit of D5 on the main spring barrel arbor before the ratchet wheel goes in. Now on the sliding pinion and the widening pinion, I'm using some Mobius 9501 thick grease. But on the technical sheet, it says you can also use D5 or HP 1300. When you're installing the sliding pinion, make sure the hacking lever is in the center of the pinion. So once again, some 9501 on the winding stem. And this is the yoke spring going in now. Some D5 on the post before the rocking bar goes in and I can hear a storm brewing. <laughs> What's the matter mate? Huh? What are you crying for? You just shouted it again. Because he came and he started slapping me and slapping me. Yes he did. Hey. Go, go. Come here. What's the matter? We were just trying to make him happy and then Aww, just like come on. slapping him. Okay. Hmm? Then you tell me what happened. Hmm? Right, so some 9501 where the rocking bar meets the yoke spring. Some D5 on the setting lever.
some D5 on the post where the yoke will sit and also in the center of the sliding pinion where the yoke will rest. Some 9501 where the yoke meets the yoke spring and some where the yoke meets the setting lever. Now I'm putting a small bit of grease on the setting lever jumper where the intermediate setting wheel will slide into place. And some D5 on the posts for the setting wheel and the intermediate setting wheel. Excuse me. And some thick grease 9501 on the setting lever spring where it meets the setting lever. D5 on the main spring barrel arbor on the great wheel and some 9010 on the escape wheel and the seconds wheel. And now I had to remove this mini counter jumper spring to deal with the rust. And so now we'll oil this side of the pivots of the train wheels. Now I'm installing the pallet fork. Bogey boy, have you had a, t heard of a tissue? <laughs> Before tightening the screws on the pallet fork bridge, give the movement a couple of winds and see if the pallet fork is installed correctly. And here I'm putting a little bit of Mobius 941 on the exit pallet jewel. Now let's install the balance to see if there is life in this old thing. Now the oils need to all settle down but I'll give it a quick test to see if everything's okay and it looks pretty decent, it just needs a little bit of fine tuning. And now I'll remove the top and bottom cap jewels and clean them and then oil them with some 9010. And now that the main movement is working, we can start assembling the chronograph mechanisms. So this is the hammer cam jumper. What are you doing under my table, mate? <laughs> you gonna cry, Bill? What is it? It's a flying car. Flying car, like the Mullah Sky car? <laughs> never heard of that, have you? Do you like it? Yeah, I love it. I've put some D5 on the crown wheel core where the chronograph cam will sit and some D5 on the ratchet wheel driving wheel. I'm using 9501 on the chronograph cam and all the oiling points are indicated on the technical sheet. D5 for the detent for the hour hammer 
and also some 9501. Now you could apply the 9501 on the chronograph cam, but I'm applying it to the detent just so that I can tick it off on my technical sheet as on the technical sheet it shows this point as the oiling point. D5 on the top and bottom operating lever posts. And before I install the operating lever, I'll install the mini counter driving wheel and the lock. I should also install the operating lever spring, but it's gone missing. And as you can see here, part of the lock is actually made from plastic. Uh, in the 25 joule version, this has been upgraded to a metal part. So now I'm installing the operating lever without the spring and I'll oil the operating lever with some D5. Now I'm installing the chronograph bridge. This is the 60 second oscillating pinion and the chronograph wheel friction. Ninety ten on the chronograph wheel. This is the reduction wheel and the 30 minute counting wheel. And now the clutch. Now here I'm applying a very small amount of 9010 on the reversing wheel. Now I'm using D5 on the hammer and there are four oiling points which will be indicated on your technical sheet. Now the automatic device bridge has a post which fits inside the reduction wheel. Now it's easier to oil the reduction wheel rather than the post because if you miss it can get quite messy. I'm using a bit of 9010 on the oscillating pinion and then I'll install the automatic device bridge. And once again, make sure everything is moving freely and that all the pivots are in their correct holes before you start screwing anything down. Then some D5 on the reversing wheel and some 9010 on the chronograph wheel. And now we can install the clutch spring and the hammer spring. And here is the missing operating lever spring. Where have you been? One of my springs is missing. And guess where it is? Well, looky, looky, there it is. Now with some gentle persuasion, the spring can still be installed at this stage. Uh, it's just a little bit more difficult than it would have been uh, before installing the operating lever. And now we'll just check that all the chronograph functions are working and that the minute counter works. Using some 9501 on this driver cannon pinion and some mullicut on the other side. Now ETA recommends that you do not wash this part and if it's dirty that you replace it with a new pre-lubricated factory part, hence why I have gone to town with the grease on this piece. Now back on the other side, some D5 on the post for the cannon pinion, and D5 on the other posts. So and these posts here. are for the minute wheel, the intermediate calendar wheel, D5 on the cannon pinion for the hour wheel, and the date indicator driving wheel. 90, Some 9010 on the hour counting wheel. Some D5 on the post for the hour counter lock and the hour hammer. And some D5 on the post for the hour hammer operating lever.
now we can install the our hammer spring and I've lubricated the points on the hour hammer and hour hammer operating lever as per the technical sheet which I seem to have lost on this clip somewhere now we can go ahead and install the calendar platform and this is the double corrector and we'll apply a small amount of D5 here also. And now we can install the date disc, also known as the date star. D5 on the post for the date jumper and the day jumper. Even though we don't have the day function on this movement, the day jumper comes with the package. Well, hey! Now we can carefully install the jumper spring and apply some D5 on the contact points. We're nearly there folks. So now we're just installing the date jumper maintaining plate. And finally, the date indicator maintaining plate. Now as you can see Breitling's attempt to make this watch look luxurious they have added some gold plated detailing here onto the case back and upon polishing I do not want to remove this by accident so I'm applying some protective lacquer. Now I have covered polishing quite extensively on my previous videos but I haven't shown you guys the use of a stitched mop. Usually I use a flat felt wheel to do the initial cutting and then I'd use some cotton mops for the final polish. Now our case profile is quite curvy, so we need something to hug the whole contour of the case and a stitch mop is perfect for this. Now my good polishing machine is in for a service and a repair, so I'm using my old Polymax and therefore I won't show you the whole process I'll just show you the gradual uh, improvements as the lighting isn't very good around this machine now as you saw in the beginning the crystal had lots of scratches which were actually scratches on the anti-reflective coating so I'm just removing these just to see what's beneath all that coating So as you can see, after removing the anti-reflective coating, there are some real scratches on the crystal. Now I really want to preserve the original rotor, so I'm going to try out this magic rhodium. I'll add some links in the description, Amazon affiliate links, which helps me out and also keeps the accountant off my back. So I have some replacement parts and I will also need to do a bit of gold plating. Uh, I've covered electro plating on my previous Jeje La Coutre video so have a look at that if you need some help.
And here you can see the difference between a worn brass rider and a gold plated rider. Here I am shortening a screw and re-threading the hole made by the previous tinkerer. Due to their previous bush fix, the normal plug will not fit in this hole any longer. And this is the replacement rider at 12, which is missing its luminous pearl. So I'll just create one. There is some corrosion and patina on these hour markers and I'm not trying to restore them but I'm just trying to remove anything that may be loose with a bit of pegwood. So I'm nearly done here folks and so let's conclude our story of this Breitling chronomat. This bold move made by Breitling was a success. The model helped Breitling to get back on its feet and it's still a popular model today. So in a sense you can say the chronomat helped Breitling survive and since then the company has gone from strength to strength and has never looked back. And there you have it folks. I tried so hard to make this a shorter video, uh, but there were so many things behind the scene that needed addressing on this watch. Um, so many gremlins and so many hidden issues. Um, and I haven't been able to add all of this into the video. And even then the video ended up being so long. So thank you for bearing with me and well done if you've lasted the distance. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. And I also hope that you have found it helpful. And if you have, then please do like, share and subscribe. Now the tinkerer who sold this watch, sold it because he was having some financial difficulties. So I might just find him and give the watch back to him to cheer him up. Because as we've learned in the media recently, there are many people out there fighting secret battles. People whose smile and energy we take for granted. And this tinkerer who sold this watch is one of those people always happy always smiling always bubbly and these people keep their problems and their secret battles inside as not to burden the rest of us and so i hope he approves of the restoration that we've done but i will be using some colorful language regarding his cheeky and audacious repairs so that's it for today folks if you do see someone who's not smiling as usual, then have a word. And I'll leave you with the words of two of our most righteous adventurers. Be excellent to each other. Stay safe, folks. And if the Almighty wills, I'll see you on the next one. Ta-ra!